Welcome to third grade. I am your teacher and host of distance learning, Mr. Rittenauer. If you'd like to make this video bigger, click the YouTube button below. Welcome. It is Friday, which means we will be playing trivia at the very end, and we're going to keep things pretty chill today. So, diving in to some words of wisdom, some common sense. If you receive a gift from somebody, be sure to show your gratitude by sending a thank you note or card within a week of receiving the gift. All right, so let me clarify a few things. First, let's get my highlighter out. First, if you receive a gift, I mean an actual gift. If someone sends you a card, you do not have to write them back a card unless you want to. If they send you a card with money, that is a gift, all right? A monetary gift. So then you must write them a thank you back. Second thing I'd like to clarify. By sending a thank you note or a card within a week. Now, sometimes... Sometimes in the excitement of a birthday or Christmas, and you have all kinds of gifts, you might not get a thank you written within a week. And you know what? That's okay. But you must, you must, you must try to get it done within two weeks. Okay? Anything after two weeks is, is just lazy. Okay? Make sure you show your appreciation by writing a thank you as promptly as possible so the next day or within the week is ideal all right so make sure you're doing that boys and girls i know at your age writing thank you stinks and nobody likes doing it but just think about it a couple minutes of your time to say thank you just a couple minutes it's all it takes to write a thank you card right can really show someone how much you appreciate their gift because what they gave you probably cost them more than just a couple minutes of their time. All right, think about it. I'm just going to throw out a figure here. I make about $20 an hour as a teacher. 20 bucks for an hour of teaching. So if I gave you a card or my cousin or my, you know, my my aunt or uncle and I sent them a card with money in it and I gave them let's just say I gave them 40 bucks. That's two hours of work. I would expect them to be polite and send back a thank you that just takes a few minutes to make, okay? So think about how much other people's time is worth, boys and girls. When you start doing that, you become a much more kind, polite young boy or girl. All right, so that's your words of wisdom. Let's watch a video about ways to say thank you. Let's just say you're more artistic than me and you want to actually make something that says thank you. So kids teach us how to say thank you. Let's watch. Why do you have those materials over there? My drawing is a heart. Heart. I want to thank my mom because she's a cool mom. So Diego, what are you drawing? A trophy for my dad. Number one dad. Because he's the best dad in the world. Can you tell us what you're drawing with the blue marker? A hot tub robot for my aunt. I'm making a monster truck. I'm going to use this to thank my mom because she took me to the monster truck show. I'm going to draw a cake. My mom is my best friend. We like baking cakes together. This is me and my dad eating a hamburger. If my dad could eat a hamburger, every day he would. Now what is a hot tub robot? It's a hot tub that walks around. <laughs> it's me and my mom. The cake's already done, so I decorated, and I have a little flower vase for it. There's a hamburger to dance. Will it, how it dance? Size of me. 
Look at that <laughs> robot. Like it? Yeah. Oh my god, it dances. Oh, it's got our hamburger on it. Thank you so much for this hamburger trophy. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Look at that. I think everyone in the world needs a monster truck. Thank you, Mommy. I want to thank you for being my best friend. That heart is as much as I love my mom. I hope a crane can hold this. Thank you. You're welcome. I love you so much. I love you so much, too. All right, I love that video, um, especially the boy who said that his dad would eat a burger every day if he could. That's me. I'm that dad. I could eat a burger every day. Um, that reminds me, I need to put out some hamburger meat for dinner tonight. Campbell and I are having burgers. <laughs> okay, let's move on to our next topic, boys and girls. We are talking about decimals for the last time ever. So the last lesson of decimals for you as future fourth graders is comparing. Whenever we compare, we usually talk about either least to greatest or greatest to least. So I hate whenever teachers purposely try to trick kids. So I'm just gonna tell you up front, I'm not trying to trick you. All, all today's lesson is going to be least to greatest, okay? That's how things are usually done from the smallest to the biggest. So I'm not going to trick you. We're going from smallest to largest the whole lesson, okay? All right, now, quick review. What is a decimal? A decimal is a fraction with a base 10 denominator. A fraction is a number that's less than 1. So decimals are less than 1. Decimals are measured in tenths or hundredths, or if you keep going, thousandths as well, and it keeps going and going and going. They get smaller by a factor of 10. So we've learned two. We've learned if this is the decimal point right here, point. We've learned the first place to the right, right where my face is, ah, tenth. And then if you have another des place, you've got hundredth. So you've got tenths and hundredths. Let's try to put numbers in order today from least to greatest using what we know and using pictures. Because I think. Drawing pictures really helps us when we're first learning. Okay, so I'm going to put my face down here where you can see everything else. All right, so we've got four numbers that we're comparing. Let's read them together, starting with the red one. You ready? 0 0.4. Let's read it in word form. 0 and 4 tenths. One more time. Zero and four tenths. So don't forget, boys and girls, that the decimal point means and. All right, let's read the green one together. Zero point zero four. Now let's read it in word form. Zero and four hundredths. So we have zero in the tenths and four in the hundredths so we read that as four hundredths like a fraction correct all right last zero point three nine let's say it in word form zero and thirty nine hundredths so if it was that would be tenths that's hundredths so thirty nine hundredths we have all right, now, before we start to compare all of our decimals, let us talk about comparing. When you compare, you always start with the greatest or least place value. You always start with the greatest place value. The greatest place value will tell you if it's bigger or smaller, unless it's the exact same. In this case, zero, zero, and zero is the greatest place value. It's the ones place. The further you are to the left, the greater you are. 
And if you look at that, all three are the same. So now we have to go next door. We have to go to the next greatest place value, which is the tenths. So let me underline my tenths. I've got a four, I've got a zero, and I've got a three. All are different numbers, so we can officially determine the order of these decimals just by looking at the tenths. But Mr. R, what about the hundredths? Well, the hundredths don't mean anything if you have different tenths because the hundredths are smaller. It'd be like me asking you this, which is bigger? 14, 40, or 39? Obviously, four and nine are bigger than zero, but we know that 40 is bigger than 14 and 39. That's all we're doing. Simple as that. Okay. So, boys and girls, which one is my least? Red, green, or yellow? What do you think? Correct. The zero is the smallest, so the green is my least. So let me take my zero point zero four and put it in my least. All right, now let's draw a picture of that. I've got zero of these tenths. If you don't know what I mean, look right here. This is the tenths. I've got zero of them. Okay? However, I have four in the hundredths. So let me grab four of my little hundredths cubes. So I've got one, I've got two, and I'm going to clone them to make three and four. All right, so that's my green. Now, which comes next? Is it 0 0.4? Or 0 0.39. Well, which is bigger, 4 or 3? Yeah, 4 is bigger, so the 3 must come next because I'm ordering it from smallest to largest. So 0 0.39 is going to come next. Let's draw a picture of 0 0.39. So look at my hundredths or my tenths place. I have three rods, three tenths. Let's grab three of these. One, two, and three. All right, now, how many hundredths do I have? Oh no, I have nine of them. I've got my work cut out for me. I've got to do nine of these little ones. So one, two, three. And now I'm going to use multiplication here to help myself. I'm going to clone three. How many times to get nine? Three times what gets nine? One, two, three. Three times three equals nine. So that will save me some time here. All right, so I've got nine hundredths. So that right there, boys and girls, in yellow is 0 0.39. Another way of thinking about it is I've got 30 and I've got nine, so 30 plus nine makes 39 hundredths. Okay, wonderful job. Oops, I went a little too crazy there. All right, now my greatest has to be 0 0.4. It's the only one left. Well, watch this. I can put a zero there, and I'm not changing my number at all. That number is still 0 0.4. It's still worth 4 tenths. But now, the way that I wrote it, it's now just read differently. Now it's 40 hundredths. But that's the same thing as 4 tenths. So let me clear and drag this down here to my greatest. All right, now one second. I just want to show you something. I put this problem in here to try to trick you because notice how this only has two numbers, two digits. It has a 0 and a 4. So a lot of third graders would think that has to be the smallest because this has 1, 2, 3. This has one, two, three. This only has two. But guess what? It's not about how many numbers. It's about place value. If it was about numbers, then my job would be so much easier. It's not. It's about place. 
And we know that 0.4 in the tenths is greater than all the other decimals that I wrote. So now let's prove it by drawing a picture. Four tenths would be four of these. I need one, I need two, and then if I clone them, I should double that to make four. All right, so I've got these four, I'm grouping them together, and I'm just gonna slide them on top here. Look how close the yellow decimal and the red decimal were. They were so close. Let me send this backwards here. I'm gonna send it back one so it's behind the yellow. All right, you can see, you can see right here, it is one hundredth larger. It's just barely bigger. All right, and let's think about that for a second. If I was dealing with whole numbers, I would have 40, that's four tenths. And if I was dealing with um, whole numbers on this one, I would have 39, because I have three tenths and nine hundredths. So which is bigger, 40 or 39? Correct, 40. Awesome work, awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, well done, boys and girls. That is how you compare decimals. Your fourth grade teachers will um, review and teach you this again next year, but hopefully next year you'll be a little more comfortable and you'll remember some of this stuff that we're learning now. All right, so now let's look at our U.S. history. So we're moving through, we're getting close to the end of our U.S. history this year. We are all the way up to the Vietnam War, which takes place during the 60s and um, into the 70s. So as we talked about many times already this week, the Vietnam War is part of the Cold War era. The Cold War meaning democracy versus communism. So the United States is on the side of democracy and the Soviet Union or Russia is on the side of communism. And there was this big, big, big debate on um, the domino theory. Do you remember the domino theory that if one country falls to communism, it knocks down all the other countries like dominoes and they all fall to communism. And we did not want that. So we got involved in a war all the way over in Asia. And I'll show you a picture of that right now. The war takes place across the world in Asia, which Vietnam is located. So right there is Vietnam. The communist countries of the Soviet Union, also known as the USSR, and China are supporting the northern side. Meanwhile, you have the USA and Great Britain supporting the southern Vietnamese, South Vietnam. And obviously you can see that the red side, the Soviet communist side, look how much closer they are to Vietnam. It's a lot easier for them to provide guns and um, bombs and air support and all kinds of things because they're literally is their neighbor. North Vietnam. It's a lot harder for us. We're a whole way across the world. Okay, so now you can picture that. You can see it. I'm going to put it back. So the Vietnam War is like, in a way, the War on Terror, which took place, which started on September 12, 2001, the day after September 11. The war. In Vietnam and the war on terror are alike because they last for a long, long time. Now, most wars in history only last a few years, so everything is focused on the war for a few years, right? And then the war is done and people go back to their lives. Vietnam War was not like that as much because of how long it lasted. 
there's a lot of other things that happen in the United States while the war is going on. Let's take a look at some of them today. So yesterday we talked about the space race and we talked about the music that was happening, like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Today, let's talk about the taking over of television and how television came onto the scene in the 60s and then colored television toward the end of the 60s. So let's watch a clip on TV. All right, this is called A History from Analog to Digital Television, okay? The 1960s were a time of great change in America and great hope. Television played a major role in shaping the events of the day. John Kennedy, in many ways, was the first American president who was a television president. During the 1960 presidential race, Kennedy effectively campaigned under the spotlight of a growing television industry. He came across wonderfully well on television. It probably made the difference in his election in 1960, the famous great debates. Visually, he came across looking much better than Richard Nixon. Those who heard the debates on radio thought Nixon had won. Those who watched on television knew that John Kennedy had won. In 1962, the race to beam pictures and sound from around the world took a major leap forward with the launch of Telstar, the first active communications satellite. These images of an American flag were the first television pictures ever sent using microwave signals. Television signals could now be bounced to such a satellite and received back from the satellite which made it possible to connect by television, let alone radio and other services, virtually any country in the world. The ability of the whole world to watch together tragically played out in the fall of 1963. Everybody was in shock at the end of November in 1963 after John Kennedy was killed. Television really came to the fore as the medium that tied the country together. For four days, there was no advertising. For four days, there was virtually no regular programming. ABC, NBC, and CBS stayed with the tragic events around the clock. So when those three networks devoted their coverage to the Kennedy tragedy and the Kennedy years and what was going on in the country and the incoming Johnson administration, we all watched along with them. We were all going through it together. In the mid-60s, social unrest filled the streets. TV provided an escape, ironically making screwball comedies like The Lucy Show the highest rated shows of the day. <laughs> color finally went mainstream. By 1968, color television sets could be found in over 14 million homes. July 16, 1969, television coverage saw another first. NASA's launch of Apollo 11, the first manned spacecraft to land on the moon and be televised live. It was the middle of the night for most Americans, but there weren't very many people sleeping at that point. Everybody was watching television. Everybody knew this was a world landmark, not just an American landmark. The nation watched as Neil Armstrong made his historic descent to the moon's surface. And with television, we were able to see it happen. We watched him put his foot on the moon. All right, so um, there's a lot of really good things in that clip uh, that we're going to actually talk about later or we ha already have talked about. So can you think of one thing that we have already talked about this week that they showed in that clip? Yeah, the space race, right? The L Apollo 11 mission. Now, before the 60s, the uh, anything like this would not have been able to have been transmitted to as many people because there wasn't television. But with the rise of television and uh, networks like ABC, NBC, and CBS, the uh, Apollo 11 landing on the moon was able to be broadcast on TV to all of America, which is incredible. Think about that. Um, Think about a world without TV. How 
would you get information? So if there's no TV, there's no internet, and there's no cell phones either, okay? So before that, how did people get information? If you're thinking the newspaper or the radio, you are absolutely correct. The radio and the newspaper were the only real, like, popular ways of getting the news back then. Now, which is more, which is more influential to you, all right? Which makes a bigger difference? Seeing something happening on TV in color, like you're there, or reading about it in a newspaper? Obviously, television, right? So television really takes the average American and puts them in the shoes of the people that are there. So watching the Apollo 11 landing, it felt like America, all of Americans, were on the moon too. When Neil Armstrong stepped out and said, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, it felt like you were there. And then during the Civil Rights Movement, which we're going to talk about more um, in our next U.S. History lesson, during the Civil Rights Movement, when Martin Luther King Jr. led a, a, uh, a revolution, basically, in the South, it felt like you were on the streets of Alabama getting sprayed with hoses and attacked by dogs. It felt like you were there, and that's what really, um, that can really grab the spirit of Americans and make them more passionate about things than just reading it in a newspaper or hearing it on a radio. All right, being able to see it and feel it, and, and it feels like you're there, and seeing people suffering can change the psyche of America, and it really does, and I think television is what helped not only John F. Kennedy get elected, but it's also what helped um, the Americans get behind the Civil Rights Movement and the Civil Rights Acts that came out in the 1960s. All right, so now let's watch a video, uh, let's switch gears here to John F. Kennedy. It's a short video about JFK, the, the president during the early 60s, and it talks a little bit about, well, it talks completely about his assassination. Assassination is whenever someone is murdered um, by somebody else in a planned murder, all right? So they, the um, JFK assassination was a setup by a man uh, named uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, but there's a lot of controversy around, was it really him or was it someone else? And you'll see why here in one second. I'm going to put on that video. U.S. President John Fitzgerald Kennedy's visit to Dallas, Texas on November the 22nd, 1963 was aimed at boosting his re-election bid ahead of the 1964 presidential vote. Thousands turned out to see the iconic leader and his wife Jacqueline travel in a motorcade through downtown Dallas. At 12.30 p.m. local time, as the president's open-top limousine reached Dealey Plaza, three gunshots were fired at the convoy. Two bullets hit the president, one wounded him at the back of the neck and throat, the other caused a massive and fatal head injury. The president was pronounced dead at 1 p.m. in an historic announcement that stunned America. A government investigation found the shots were fired from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository by 24-year-old Lee Harvey Oswald, but the suspect was never tried. Two days later, he was shot dead by local cabaret owner Jack Ruby during a prison transfer. The fact the identity of Kennedy's assassin was never proven in the courts has given rise to various alternative and unproven theories as to what really happened and who may have been behind it. A House of Representatives report in 1979 concluded there was a high possibility that two gunmen were involved. Okay, so as you can see in the video, the uh, shooter, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, was not actually um, tried in a court because two days after he was arrested, he ended up um, getting killed by a man named Jack Ruby. Jack Ruby was kind of a sketchy, to say the least, character. He owned a local bar, and um, there's a lot of rumors and conspiracy theories that Jack Ruby was also in on the, uh, on the plot to assassinate JFK. But history will need to go a little bit longer before we can find out any proof of any of this. Because as of right now, the 
investigation is concluded and um, as far as history is concerned, Lee Harvey Oswald shot JFK and was the only one involved in the assassination. So when JFK died, the person that took over was named LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And if you know anything about American history, you know that when a president is shot or killed during office or dies, the who, I'm sorry, takes over. Do you remember the name, the title? So if the president can't do his job or he's dead, the what takes over? Yes, the vice president. Very good. I'm glad you remember that. The VP. It's kind of like in room 304 when the president is not there at school or at somewhere else. The vice president is the one that assumes the role of president. So when JFK dies, LBJ has to take over. And he has to take over during a really difficult time in American history. We're at the height of the Cold War. We're also just getting involved in the Vietnam War. So LBJ has his hands full. Um, and LBJ did a lot of terrible things. Um, and he did some good as well. But he certainly was not, um, he was not JFK. We'll just say that. Okay. One last thing to talk about that was happening during the 60s in the Vietnam War was the hippie movement. Now, you probably heard of hippies, like peace men. Hippies were um, pretty much, in general, they are younger Americans, usually in the late teens or in 20s, sometimes even in the 30s, who um, many did drugs like acid, which is known as LSD, or smoked marijuana, uh, which is also a drug and is illegal. And they believed mainly in love, like free love. Everyone should just love each other, and we should all just be one big happy family, and we should hug each other, and kiss each other and yeah i know gross right and everybody should just be peaceful and love so obviously if there's a war going on the vietnam war is the opposite of love right war is the opposite of love it involves killing each other so the hippies hated the war the hippies would do things all the time to try to stop the war like hold protests and burn things and scream and shout in the streets um, to get the war to stop. Now, I'm going to show you a very short clip of what the hippie movement kind of looked like. So think about like those old school, like Scooby-Doo vans, you know, like the uh, mystery machine. A lot of hippies drove those around um, and they wore big bell bottoms and they had r really long hair and they put flower, uh, braids of flowers in their hair, the girls did. And the guys would wear um, button up shirts and they'd show off their chest hair and you know the, the hippies did a lot of weird things so let's look at some pictures of the hippie movement how i live my hippie life what a far out trip in my heart is love for others all my sisters and my brothers all right so i'm just gonna pause it there uh you can see there's they decked out a school bus and there a lot of the men are shirtless and this guy's got on a mil the guy in the front has a military an army outfit on and they would wear sometimes military outfits ironically to protest the war that was happening in vietnam Okay, so let me exit out of that, and I'm going to finish reading the words as I have on the screen. So um, I believe it's this one. Nearly 60,000 American troops died during the Vietnam War. Many things are happening in our country, the space race. Blah, blah, blah. I've already talked about that. The USA was the first country to put a man on the moon in 1969. Rock and roll took over with the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Beach Boys, Bob Dylan, Johnny Cash, Jimi Hendrix. Colored television became popular in all American 
households with shows like the Flintstones, the Jetsons, and Batman. So maybe you've heard of those shows. Live news was also shown on TV, which made things more realistic and personal. In 1963, Kennedy was assassinated. Um, amidst the violence of the Vietnam War, there was anti-war groups that formed, known as hippies. America experienced its first real drug problem during the hippie movement. The hippies did a lot of drugs. And the struggle for equality between black and white Americans reached its pinnacle during the civil rights movement in the 1960s. The Vietnam era was both exciting and a tragic time in our history. Okay. So uh, I want to leave you with a couple things. One, the Vietnam War was unsuccessful. Two, the things that were happening during the Vietnam War shaped our country um, so much that we are still feeling the effects of it to this day. For instance, the drug movement in the 60s with the hippies, yeah, that's still happening in America today. Drug use is incredibly high, and um, you can trace it back, all the way back to the 1960s when people started experimenting with drugs in America. What else happened in the 60s? Oh, yes, the television. We still have TVs in our homes to this day, right? That was a big thing that came out during the 60s. Uh, the civil rights movement. Um, the treatment of blacks and whites is equals. Um, racism is still alive in this world today, but it's gotten a lot better thanks to the uh, civil rights movement and Martin Luther King Jr. What else? Oh, yes, NASA, the uh, space program in America, um, once, they've once they accomplished their mission to the moon in the 60s, um, they were able to continue to um, advance our science and technology with regards to outer space. And they've been a part of the International Space Station and the Hubble Telescope, which takes all the amazing pictures that we see nowadays from distant galaxies. Um, the programs that the 60s um, leaders created, like LBJ creating like social security, welfare, and uh, all those programs um, have really put a drain on our uh, economy to this day. The federal budget um, is dominated by the welfare and entitlement programs that happened during the 60s. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means that our country is falling further and further into debt because of some of these programs that came out of the 1960s. So we won't get into that. You can talk about that with your high school history teachers one day. But um, there you have it. The Vietnam War, huge, huge, huge part of American history and overall a pretty negative part of our history, um, if I'm being a fair historian. Um, so anyway, next time we will talk about, um, I believe we're on to the 1970s or the 80s, one of those two. But a lot of a lot more to talk about before the end of the school year. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Friday and an incredible weekend. I think Saturday is supposed to be beautiful. Sunday, not so much. So anyway, I love you guys, and I will see you next week. Oh, wait. One more thing. If you'd like to, you can call, uh, call it quits now and finish your Google form. Um, but if you would like to do some trivia, I've got trivia coming next. So you pick. You can either shut me off now, and I won't blame you. Or you can stick around for a couple more minutes and do trivia. It's up to you. There, uh, like I said in the past, if you'd like to bust out some M&Ms or, you know, goldfish, whatever, to give yourself a reward. I've heard many stories from parents being awesome parent teachers and busting out pennies or nickels or, you know, all kinds of cool rewards. So keep that up if you want. Um, I'm going to show that now. If you don't want to stick around, I don't blame you. You can go and finish your Google form and go about your Friday. But if you do want to stick around, here's trivia. Okay, number one. The largest newspaper in our area is called the Sharon... The answer is Herald. The Sharon Herald. We also have a somewhat local newspaper in Mercer called the Record Argus. That takes out of Greenville. 
and you have the Allied News, which comes out of Grove City. So those are two other popular newspapers in Mercer, but the largest is definitely the Sharon Herald. Um, number two, what medal does third place get in the Olympics? So I'm talking about the metal of the medal. What type of metal is it? The answer is not gold, that's first, not silver, that's second, but bronze. Bronze is like a brownish color, that's third place, bronze. All right, what's the largest brass instrument? So think about your brass instrument. One example is the trumpet, and that is not the largest, not even close. You might have said the saxophone, that's a pretty large instrument, but the saxophone is actually a woodwind because you blow through a reed. Not the French horn, not the trombone, but the largest brass instrument is the tuba. You know, the really large circle on top and it wraps around your body. You have to wear it like a backpack. That is the largest, the tuba. Okay, what is a butterfly slash mod, either one's tongue called? Remember, it rolls up. It looks, looks like this. And then it uncurls to get into the flowers. Um, the, uh, I'm blanking on the word. Not pollen, but the nectar. The answer is called a proboscis. A proboscis. That was a tough question. If you got that right, give yourself double reward. Okay. What continent has countries like France, Germany, England, Spain, Switzerland, Sweden, Denmark, Portugal, Western Russia, Ukraine, Italy, Greece? What, con what continent? The answer is Europe. Europe. What do you call someone who couldn't hold their bladder and had to go to the restroom in, in their pants? You call them European. Ba -bum. Shh. Get it? European? Shh. Okay. I know you missed my lame jokes. Next. What fairy tale does a fair maiden have to spin straw into gold? This is by the Brothers Grimm. It is. Rumpelstiltskin, remember the little guy who saves the fair maiden on one condition that she gives Rumpelstiltskin her firstborn child? Yeah, and then she finally guesses his name correctly so she doesn't have to give up her baby. All right, next question. What wood is the strongest? It is also America's tree. America. It's also in the expression, your word is as strong as... Oak. The answer is oak. Oak is very strong and durable wood. All right. Almost done here. What direction does a screwdriver or drill tighten a screw? This was a common sense lesson. To tighten a screw, you go righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. So righty-tighty means you go clockwise. Righty-tighty will tighten the screw unless they put it backwards okay um two more questions i think yes two more questions what yellow fish sorry not yellow yellowish it's like greenish yellow is the much smaller cousin of the walleye this is for all my fish lovers so it's a lot smaller than a walleye. It's called a yellow. The answer is perch. A perch is a cousin much smaller than the walleye. All right, last question from the Bible. What is the name of the giant man that David defeats? It's even part of the title of the story. The answer is Goliath. David defeats Goliath in the story called David and Goliath. He uses a slingshot and destroys the giant, even though David is just a wee little kid like you. All right, that's all I have for you. Enjoy your weekend, and I hope that you crushed it on trivia because...
most of that is stuff that you've already learned. So I will see you on Monday. Enjoy your weekend.